Hi, I'm Paola Espitia with Olapai Creative. Welcome to Conversations with Paola, a weekly video series exploring what it takes to make change. We share unfiltered, intimate, and inspiring conversations with wave makers in blue spaces around the world. This is it. This moment is the bit that we can influence. It's, it's dreams and goals are really important, but the bit that we where we make a change is actually in the moment now. So that really matters to me, being aware of the ripple effect of our actions. That's the epitome of what the ocean is to me. It's just like my heart and soul and it's love and it's connection. It was something that, that was going to stick with him for quite a while. I mean, read lots of books. Books will motivate you. Experience things. Experiences will motivate you. Watch interviews like this. But I have to say being able to go out and make an impact. How many people do you interact with every day? You can be a change maker for all of those people. Now it's time for us to say, okay, everybody's had their chance. Now it's time to say, we're ready. We're going to kick it off and we're going to start making our beach the most environmentally friendly. And we, we love so water. We love you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi there, everyone. And welcome to this episode of Conversations with Paola. This is our web series, in which case we are showcasing the work of people around the world who are doing something good for the health of our oceans and ultimately bettering our blue planet. Today, I am thrilled to introduce you all to an amazing person that I actually got a chance to meet on a cruise through Cuba while I was speaking at sea. That's one of the benefits of getting a chance to do that position is that I get to meet fascinating people. And so I'd like to welcome you all and welcome Mr. Ronaldo Brutoco. Hi, Ronaldo. How are you? Hi, Paolo. It's good to see you again. And it was fun to be on the water with you. It sure was. I mean, what better place is there to hang out than on the water, right? <laughs> in Cuba. <laughs> you know, they, they say that the, the worst day in the water is better than the best day in the office. <laughs> you got that right. That's absolutely for sure. So thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. I had such a pleasure meeting you. We had wonderful conversations while we were at sea. And I, I certainly realized that we needed to make sure that we expanded our conversations so that more folks could be involved because what you're doing is extremely important and very relevant to what's going on in the world today. Uh, before we get into your background though, I wanted to ask what is your most memorable experience with water? Well, <clears throat> you know, it's um, there's two of them. One of them, a negative experience, because uh, I almost drowned. And so that has a way of leaving an, a, a major impression on your mind when I was quite young. I was a uh, freshman in college, I believe, and uh, in the ocean. And uh, But it also taught me profound respect for the ocean, which I've always loved. I've been a scuba diver. I, I actually took, I, I became a scuba diver after that incident, actually. And so um, it, it taught me a profound respect for the ocean. And because at that point, I only knew the turbulence of the sea at the top as it had as this big wave knocked me over kind of thing took me down uh I, and it changed my life then when i went under the sea because as you know as a scuba diver uh three-fifths of the planet was covered by water the variety of flora and fauna below the ocean's surface is far greater than it is above the surface. Mm -hmm. uh what's going on in the ocean is far more important to human survival than the biggest forest in the world i mean it's People don't realize um, how dependent we are as human beings. And that although we emerged as amphibians probably a million of years ago, millions of years ago, um, from the ocean, the ocean never left us. You know, it, it astounds me that people don't know that amniotic fluid is ocean water. They don't know that. That, that we are literally protected from conception to birth by swimming in the ocean, connect with an umbilical cord that gives us the, 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 nour the nourishment and the, and the oxygen. So because people don't understand that, they, they, they don't think of them and the ocean as one. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think I've had more success explaining to people how the trees are like your lungs, but the real lungs of the planet are the ocean. Mm -hmm. And the real incubators for life on the planet has always been, from the beginning of time, has been the oceans. And it may very well be that we find ourselves in a situation within your lifetime uh, where the oceans are so inhospitable, fish cannot live there. Uh, we can't survive at sea level because of temperatures. And we would have to abandon the oceans 
as increasingly not survivable for humans and not a value and start going high to the mountaintops. And um, that's a terrible, terrible statement about how badly we have messed up the environment or the ecosystem. Um, to, people thought that you could do anything to the oceans mm -hmm. and, and it could make a difference when we know that's not true. You know that there's a piece of microplastic in every human being on the planet now, whether you live by an ocean or not. Every fish carries it. Uh, there, I, I think the someone predicted that the amounts of pieces of plastic in the ocean will exceed the fish in another 10, 15 years. And we've done, and we've got, we, and, and we now have found that those microplastics are also at the bottom of the ocean and they're in layers between here and there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the vastness of the ocean has confused people into what is its potential fragility in the face of uh, what we're now calling, what do we call this? We call this the anthrop Anthropocene era. So the, the era of where humans are having greater effect on climate than vice versa. And, and, and that's the first time we've named an era after a non-natural event or cause. We usually named it after you know, what, what triggered it. And, and it, this is clearly being caused and promulgated by humans. And so it's an anthropomorphic problem. And, and so I guess the, the, the greatest um, joy underwater for me, um, it, it's hard to, to say because every time you scuba dive, it's another thrill ride. Yeah, and, absolutely. You, know, you asked me that question that what flashed through my mind was this incredible coral head I saw off, off um, an island in the Caribbean that was like a 30 foot high coral head. And, and uh, then I can, then what flashed back with these other, this sunken wreck I dived on. And another thing that flashed by was a coral area I'd been to that was just gorgeous because of the variety of coral in it. And, uh, and as you know, uh, the best diving is in the top 60 feet, right? Because yes, you, right. Like to, mm -hmm. you like to be up there. And at that vantage point, floating in neutral buoyancy conditions, meaning you're not going up or down, you're just at one, one altitude of the water, um, and just kicking gently for propulsion, you become more immersed in the element of water mm -hmm. and in the reality of ocean. And and I, I've never met a scuba diver who doesn't take the ocean seriously. Mm. So there's 35,000 divers now that belong to a thing called Reef Check, which you may have heard of. Of course, and yes. Mm -hmm. They voluntarily measure the health of reefs, and it's not good. And every time they go diving, they measure it and turn in the data. They're based here in LA, Reef Check. The former chairman of the board is a good friend of mine. Oh, nice. Uh, Gary. And, and um, the, the results from those checks are becoming more and more graphically disturbing. So the, the, twin, the twin images for me when you ask the question is one of the fear and the, the learning instant respect for the ocean when I almost drowned, coming out of it and going, hmm, I really want to learn about what's going on here, to then becoming a scuba diver and going, oh, my God, what an what a unbelievably beautiful thing. And if that one incident had kept me from becoming a scuba diver, what a tragedy. And it did, unfortunately. Now, you're, you're so right. I mean, that's something that I always describe to folks when I dive is that it's it's as though you're going to safari. You step into safari every single time you go underwater. No matter where you look, you can really literally be staying in one one meter square spot and everything you look at is alive. Everything is living and the colors and textures and patterns you see underwater are unlike anywhere else. And then not to mention just that freedom of flotation that you gain through scuba diving or just through being in water, it really is such uh, an amazing experience and it does it opens your eyes and it really helps you truly appreciate that, that the ocean is real i like that that you said that because you're so right everything that is so amazing about the ocean is out of sight and out of mind for a lot of people and so that's why we don't really see the effects because and of they, that and, and people who live along the coast have, have seen and there who aren't fishermen have seen the power of the ocean in rage and it scares them yeah mm -hmm. See this huge waves of these storm conditions and they should be scared and, and we're getting it's getting worse as you know because the differential temperature is causing far worse storms and that's going to continue in the future um but because of that like like oh my gosh look at that 50 foot wave I better get back people don't realize that the ocean below the surface um doesn't have any storms like that yeah there are no storms below the surface. In fact, uh, there was a kid's movie that came out a year or so ago called Aquaman. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a Marvel comic character who I didn't really know much about. Uh, and my grandson wanted me to go to it. And I, well, I'll check the trailer. 
and I saw the trailer and I was immediately hooked because I said, you know, I'll go watch this movie just for the under, underwater scenes. I'll go with underwater what it was, right? Right. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> but I just, it's like, okay, I'll take whatever amount of violence they want to throw at me in colored lights because this is so pretty to be under the water. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> super true. Right. Well, um, thank right. you. Thank you for those of you who are joining us. I just wanted to catch you up here. We're having a conversation with Mr. Ronaldo Brutoco. It's somebody I met while on our Cuba cruise. And what's so fascinating about you, Ronaldo, is that you have such actually a diverse background. You've come from um, the, the law sector, economy, phys, um, uh, philosophy. I love that that uh, one of your descriptions is that you're a futurist, you're an author. And at the end of all of these titles, all of these unique perspectives you've gained throughout the years is climate change mitigation analysis, strategist. Where did you get interested or how did you become interested in climate change? That's a great question. We um so I started the World Business Academy in 1986, and we got our, our tax exemption in 87. And the, um, when, we, when I started it, it the, the goal was to try to reform business. The, the, the business roundtable statement said two days ago is exactly why we started the academy in the mm -hmm. 1980s. Um, and when we started the academy, it was intending to see um, if we could get business to start acting in a more responsible fashion towards society. It wasn't the environment initially. Mm -hmm. And we started looking at these very interesting questions. And um, about, I'm going to say, 19 years ago now, um, we devoted a lot of work to what we developed uh, an understanding of what's called peak oil that happened, or Hubbard's peak, it's sometimes referred to in the United States, uh, when our pumping of oil through conventional means peaked out in the 70s. Mm. And many people in business started asking, well, if oil has peaked out, and that means the price of oil is going to go up and up and up then what's going to happen and how is it going to get replaced? So we started looking at that as a business question. How does society function if its principal fuel becomes more and more expensive? Uh, and once we got into it, we realized, oh my goodness, peak oil is not the problem. It's much bigger than that. It's, 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 and, and we started looking at renewable energy. And so I did a, I convened a two day seminar in, in Santa Barbara with about 250, 300 CEOs and C-suite people. And um, we met for, I guess about two and a half, three days. And one of the panels, because it was a broad range of subjects about business responsibility. And one panel was on uh, basically the future of energy. And we got Amory Lovins, who's a fellow of the Academy, who's very big in energy and, and uh, from the Rock and Roll Institute. Uh, he sent one of his top guys because he couldn't come. We had a couple other interesting people that got involved with us that were uh, interested in that topic. And the, and the end result was after doing two panels back to back in that weekend, it became clear to me that the business community had no idea what was coming, zero. And that was an alarm bell. So we decided that we needed to create a book, which we did um, called um, Freedom from Mideast Oil, which was about the beginning of renewals. And uh, that book came out, uh, I guess about, I don't know, 13, 14 years ago, maybe 13 years ago. And in it, we went through every form of renewable technology. And we correctly predict the winners and losers. The book is about that thick. It's a very thick book, and it's got tons and tons of footnotes. And I must say, I'm very proud of the fact not a single footnote has ever been refuted since it was released. Fantastic. Uh, nor, any, nor any major concept that we threw out there, including we, we've talked about a number of things, including brown gas, and that people weren't even looking at as the way to capture methane from dairy farming and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so we, you know, follow the obvious stuff and then stuff that wasn't so obvious. And, you know, solar, of course, wind and all that sort of thing. And we also looked at tidal, by the way, and some other ocean-related mm -hmm. sciences, geother uh, geothermal. In the course of writing that book, we became increasingly aware of the environmental destruction that was happening that renewable energy could address. Mm -hmm. Just before we published it, literally three minutes before, three months before we published it, and it was all done. It was in final edit. It was, it was like ready to come off the press. And you know, if you've done a book, it's like when you're three months out, it's over. It's, it's like slam the door because you got to get this. <laughs> um, we heard of this story um, of the Monterey Aquarium, mm -hmm. which has an excellent research division, and they detected upwellings. So bubbles escaping from the uh, bottom of the ocean 
off of the Santa Barbara coast, actually, which is kind of why I guess I caught it caught my attention because I live in Santa Barbara. Right. And, and, and so as I looked into what was causing that, there were different theories of what might be causing those bubbles. And so I said, hmm, that's really interesting. So I, I, I didn't want to stop the book to do a whole new chapter on what's coming out of the ocean when these bubbles. So I decided to go see the fellow who was at that point the chairman of the IPCC Japanese American panel. So the chairman of the, probably one of the two best panels in the world for IPCC. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Professor Bergard. And he, at that time, his office was as a professor, uh, he was the professor at the uh, University of Hawaii, but his job was climate, basically. And um, he had gotten a copy of my book on Mideast oil and, and, and the renewable energy issues and was fascinated by it and wanted to talk to me about that. And I was fascinated about what these bubbles were. Mm -hmm. So we agreed to meet in Honolulu and um, I got a chance to ask him after he, he interrogated me for about 45 minutes. I got a chance to ask him. It was my turn. Okay. Well, the reason I'm here is what's going on with these bubbles? And he said, well, that's a really good question. We don't know. And I said, oh, that's interesting. We don't know. I said, you know, I've heard a rumor that the possibility is that this is the beginning of hydrate, methane hydrate releases from the ocean floor. Now, um, Santa Barbara Channel is a very unusual body of water, as you may know. Most people don't. But the we don't have a continental shelf in Santa Barbara, as is typical when you have a fall off of land masses into the ocean, mm -hmm. because our continental shelf is on the other side of the Channel Islands. So the mm -hmm. Channel Islands in California actually are a mountain range that's attached to the same continental landmass that we're on. Mm -hmm. But for historical reasons, <clears throat> there's a 1,000 foot trench between us and those mountains, which is a very big, deep V. And that causes, because of the proximity to the continental shelf, the continent itself, it causes a lot of very, very fast moving water to go through there. It's got a current. And it's cold because it's a thousand feet deep that close to shore. So I can I can take my little skiff and I can go, you know, two miles, three miles off, and I'm in I'm over a thousand feet of water. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. very, very unusual. It's not normal for an ocean. So Bagar Professor uh, Ben basically said, look, it could be that the topographical characteristics of the Santa Barbara Channel are so unique <clears throat> that something's happening there <clears throat> that we don't know what it is because it'll never happen anywhere else. On the other hand, I asked him, how would you know it's a hydrate release? He said, well, well, wait for the second one to appear. And if it appears in totally different oceanographic conditions, then you know you got a problem. I said, okay, what do you think it is? He said, well, I'm a scientist. I can't tell you that because I don't have enough data. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think I heard you have grandchildren. He said, yeah. I said, as a grandfather, what would you want to guess knowing that you didn't know, but you'd like your grandchildren to be protected? What would you guess? Would you guess it's the beginning of hydrate release? He said, let me put it this way. I'm pretty nervous about it, but hmm. we don't know. Well, four years later, the second one appeared. We Now, they've been, it's been going on all over the oceans. It's just, humans hadn't seen it because it appeared in places in the ocean where people weren't watching Right. But the second one was located, I believe, up in um, the North Sea. And now, of course, the biggest ones are in the Arctic, where there are you know, kilometer square areas of ocean <clears throat> where there's so much gas coming up that it looks like a fish feeding frenzy. And as an ocean person, you know, when fish are feeding, they, they're slithering all over, they're flashing, and, and it, it creates chop on the, on the surface. That's what it looks like when these bubbles come up in, in the Arctic. <clears throat> so. And, and that's what you would expect because the Arctic guts the largest differential of temperature change of any place in the ocean, right? seven mm -hmm. degrees, which is new, but that's what's happening. So uh, it turned out that was what it was, hydrate releases. So starting about 12 years ago, I began actively investigating the possibility of hydrate releases. And when you start to do that, you, you, start to, you have to look at the biosphere in the broadest possible context. Mm -hmm. and, and because that hydrate release, which we came to conclude and we now know for a fact is accurate, that hydrate release is occurring because two things keep those hydrates locked up. <clears throat> and maybe I just digress for people who don't know. A hydrate is a <clears throat> solid form of carbon dioxide, in effect. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> Some other things, but that's what's the primary problem from our point of view. And it's, they're kept in, um, in it, there's a thing in science called phase change. 
So when you take a cup of water and you boil it, it turns to steam. That's a phase change, meaning it went from a liquid to a gas. If I put the same water in a freezer, it goes through a phase change, it goes to a solid. Right? Mm -hmm. water. So you, people are very familiar with phase changes when you describe it that way. Okay. Yeah, that's great. That, yeah. Well, what the hydrate releases is a phase change. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we, the most, the, the largest storehouse of carbon dioxide and methane on the planet is in the ocean floor. Waiting. And it's kept there by two things. Cold, the temperature of the depths, and pressure, the amount of water on top of it. <clears throat> the amount of water on top of it isn't changing enough one way or the other to affect the pressure. In other words, if we have a, like 10 inch, inches of sea lot rise, which in the coasts, Florida, would be a massive trauma. Mm -hmm. the, the, the pressure at 3,000 feet underneath the ocean, it doesn't change at all, right? Yeah. But the temperature change of the ocean does. When you change the temperature or the pressure, you can cause that solid carbon dioxide or methane and methane, you can cause it to release. So when it's in its solid form, think of it like ice, the name for it is hydrate. When it starts to get a change in temperature and starts to release in the form of a gas, that's the phase change, and comes gurgling to the surface, that is a hydrate release. And what it's releasing is massive amounts of methane. Now, we know we've been studying for longer than 12 years methane release um, in the uh, permafrost. And I was becoming very concerned about that. But my calculations were that there probably wasn't enough in the methane and the permafrost to end human civilization. Hmm. And I figured it'd be a hell of a problem, but we could figure out, we, we might be able to get around that one. Maybe true, maybe not. We've since learned a lot more about the amount of methane in permafrost over the last, say, 10 years. And if people haven't seen, the, the, there are pictures literally that look like shells that exploded, yeah. artillery shells for the methane gas exploding up out of the permafrost. So it, there's a lot there, and I don't want to diminish. And, and by the way, the amount of methane being released by fracking is a significant contributor. The amount of methane being released by uh, cows is not that significant. And, and we now know red seaweed from the ocean can eliminate 90% of the methane cows create. Most people don't know that. Absolutely, because, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like it's 10% or less of the feed is red seaweed, and you get no belching and uh, no biogas or very 90% reduction. And, and most people don't even realize that the way cows create methane is through their mouth. They release it through their mouth more than their tail. But mm -hmm. Again, most people don't know that. So you can deal with cows. Feed them seaweed. And we mm -hmm. should come back to seaweed because seaweed is one of the great industries of the future, I believe. Yes, I believe that too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and one of the ones that will last longer than fish, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Because of the adaptability of seaweed. Um, Although even seaweed, as you know, is under tremendous stress in many places in the world. Right. I believe, and the paper that I just released a month and a half, two months ago, called the Methane Accelerator, where we documented these massive amounts of methane coming out are so great now that if the, if the human civilization that we are part of went to zero CO2 release tomorrow morning, it is too late. Hmm because the methane being released in the oceans is now causing more heat to the atmosphere mm -hmm. than is human releases of CO2, even though they grew last year more than they were the year before. Yeah. And when you hear this was the hottest July in history, part of that is CO2, but a bigger part of that is now methane. Now, I say that because people need to know we cannot survive this runaway methane. It's not survivable for human civilization as, as, as an organization. Pockets of humanity could survive conceivably, but not civilization as you know it. So what do we do about that? Well, in, in the World Business Academy, I never like to write up a problem, even what I've been studying for 12 years, mm -hmm. unless I've got a proposed solution. So I, I, I put the lid on this research about five years ago, trying to figure out what the solution was. And then we just kept tracking more data, more data, more data. So that when I was ready to release, it's like, okay, I've got to release the darn thing. Right. But we all had a solution. And the solution is we believe that we can basically, and there's a, a term you, people use called geoengineering. Mm -hmm. And what it means is global scale engineering solutions. A lot of environmentalists who are my friends, because I'm well known as an environmentalist, um, we're afraid of that word because they were afraid it would give people permission to go, oh, well, we can fix it. 
technology will solve it. So yeah. just, keep, just keep doing CO2. We're past that point. That was a, that's a fiction that's no longer true. The reality is if we don't intervene, the system's now out of control. It's a runaway. So we have to, as humans, intervene. And so we began studying about five years ago every conceivable way we could come up with to get the oceans to get cooler. Hmm. None of them made any sense. So we came up with one of our own. And uh, it's called Earth Shades. And how it works is very simple. When you sit by a window and you get direct sunlight, you get so hot, you go, oh, better pull the shade now. And you instantly cool by 15 degrees because the sun is no longer radiating directly at you. Mm -hmm. Earth Shades are the same way. What we want to do is erect 40,000 one kilometer square pieces of mylar in a low earth orbit around the equator to block incoming solar radiation. Why the equator? Because that's the, piece, that's, that's the place of maximum solar impact, right? That's where it gets the hottest. Number two, that's where all of the ocean conveyor systems start, <clears throat> okay? And people don't understand the currents. Well, maybe we'll just touch on that a little bit because that's so important. And the currents have been screwed up, just like the jet stream have been. Right. Mm -hmm. now, so if we were to launch those into orbit, the cost of that is a tiny fraction of losing human civilization, not to mention the loss of human life. However, what I always look for in any potential solution is how do you stop it when it achieves its objective? In other words, how do you avoid unintended consequences? Hmm. And the answer with that is you literally, I, we've got an engine that I and the, there's, a, the, uh, there's an engine called hydrazine. And a hydrazine engine is like a miniature little rocket engine. And it's, uh, it's, it's famous because it's the only kind of rocket engine that can burn in the absence of oxygen. So hmm. every time you ever saw a space shuttle or a rocket going, those positioning thrusters, those are miniature hydrazine engines. That's what they are. That's every single time. Well, the father of hydrazine globally was a member of the academy and um, interesting man. He was a uh, he was a Holocaust survivor, just an amazingly special guy. And he and I uh, designed an engine, a miniature hydrazine engine. It's about that big, about 18 inches long, 18, 19 inches long. Mm -hmm. And the purpose is to be able to put one of these on every kilometer square piece of mylar. And when the temperature of the earth starts to cool as it will, by remotely triggering that for a six, seven to second burst, hmm. it'll bring that mylar back into the upper atmosphere and it will burn up on reentry. There'll be nothing left. But, you know, it'll be vaporized. Yeah. So that we can control the temperature as the planet starts to heal. Because hmm. what we don't want is create another ice age. So earth shades literally are the way to put the shade up when you need that protection and bring them down one at a time as the planet's biosphere starts to stabilize, which it will. So that's part A of the solution. Without that, there will be no human civilization that we can come in 30 years, 40 times. And I'm sure people listening, I'm sorry? 30 years, 40 times, no human civilization. And people, Hearing that right now, I mean, I'm sure that just that alone is blowing their minds. I mean, the, you know, what, one of the benefits that I get with um, getting a chance to speak to such diverse audiences is that you really get a chance to understand perspectives and where people are coming from, what they know, where the misinformation is. And with the issue like climate change, I mean, one of our biggest obstacles is that it's out of sight. And for some people, they're not associating the facts that just increased allergies, increased heat temperatures that this is signs, true signs of climate change affecting them. So we're talking such a big concept and this solution is, you know, yeah. sci-fi for a lot of people. But it's not, it's science. There's no fiction to it. Right, right, exactly. And, and, and uh, to give you some idea how good the science is on that, mm -hmm. when I released that paper, a friend of mine forwarded a copy without telling me in advance. She wanted it reviewed by, um, a guy named Dennis Bushnell. Dennis is the chief NASA scientist. Hmm. He read it. He called me the next morning. He said, you nailed it. You absolutely yeah. nailed it. Okay. And I said, well, thanks. You agree with me? He goes, there's not a thing wrong with it. If anything, you're a little too optimistic. That's a quote. <laughs> and because and, and, I said to him that the, everybody on the planet would start knowing that this, the end was in sight easily by 2025, and the effects of it would become increasingly impossible to live with by 2030, and it'd be gone by 2050. So, and that's and that's accurate. 
So what can we do? Well, earth shades is the way to deal with methane release. And if we don't, because every day more methane is being released, which then in turn causes more methane to be released, which causes more methane to be released. And to give you some idea of how deadly that methane is, the last time we had a burp where the methane came up in one shot, and we don't know over what period of time, was uh, 250 million years ago. Mm. And we refer to that period as an extinction period mm -hmm. because... 90% of all life forms on land and in the sea died. So we're talking about something that's going to destroy human civilization first, and then we'll continue to run away unless the planet can restable itself without humans, without humans, which it might, by the way. Yeah. Now, I want to go to the second possibility, second thing you need to know about, which is carbon, uh, carbon dioxide, CO2, which we also trace. And we're now at 412 ppm, 407 on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, th anything above 350 is not safe. And we're it's climbing constantly. Mm -hmm. Well, we we started writing about two years ago about a new technology <clears throat> which was being developed for the wrong reason, but was actually the right technology. It's called direct air capture (DAC). Mm -hmm. And DAC is now a commercial reality. There are two DAC plants, direct air capture plants, working in the planet right now. A third one's under construction. Eventually, you're going to see tens of thousands of these plants. And what do they do? They're like um, they look like a, um, if, if you saw a picture of it, like looks like little squares and each one's got a propeller in it, okay? And what it does is it sucks the air through those squares and it extracts the CO2 and takes the carbon out and lets the air go by, okay? So it's a carbon extraction technique for the air. And the nice thing about CO2, unlike methane, if you take CO2 out of the air anywhere, you take it out of the air everywhere because it's ambient okay? and it's close to the surface of the planet. <laughs> so with direct air capture, which, and we, and we now know the price, by the way. The price for a ton of carbon pulled out back out of the air is $100 a ton. And, it, and that'll go down, but that's what it is. So if we put a $100 tax on a ton of carbon, we say, look, we're gonna charge you 100 bucks, that's what's gonna cost us to get it back. In fact, I'm making 105 because you gotta pay to collect it. But <laughs> at the end of the day, we know we can suck that stuff out of the air as fast as we want to, if we're willing to pay the price of $100 a ton to do it, and that price will go down over time with volume. So now the two problems we face that put human civilization on the edge of extinction, literally, carbon dioxide, we can deal with, we got the technology, we know the price, methane, earth shades, we probably know the price, we certainly know the technology. Those two can save human civilization. Now my question would be this, if that's all it takes, why wouldn't you do it? Right. Mm -hmm. Now that's the question. You know why? Because of what you said. People weren't taking it seriously. And so what happened? Well, you know, back in the 1500s, people had a thing called the flat earth theory. Mm. At the edge of the earth, you fall off, right? If anybody walked up to you today and said, you know, I believe in the flat earth theory, you go, well, that ain't the theory, that's religion. It's round. And they say, no, I want to argue with you, buddy. You go, you know what? Save it. I don't want to argue about the flat earth theory. If you really think there's a flat earth, I can't help you. <laughs> if you really don't get climate change is happening, I really cannot help you. I'm not going to try and convince you. Right. But here is what is happening that is convincing people. Superstorm Sandy, when it hit New York and it flooded everything up to 39th Street, hmm. took the belief of climate change in the New York metropolitan area from 46% to 86%. They have believers now because they saw the water in the streets. If you talk about climate change in Miami, people might want to say, well, I'm not going to worry about it, but they know it's there because on a clear, sunny day, they're standing in three feet of water. That's right. right? Okay. And, and it's not getting better. And, and Miami's been raising their streets two feet. whoop de doo How often are you going to do that? <laughs> better right. put them on the jacks. It's <laughs> 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 Problem. And you can't hold the ocean. And by the way, I, I, I love the idea of building dikes. I've, I've come up with some interesting ideas for it. But at the end of the day, that's not the solution. The solution is to stop screwing up the biosphere. Period. Mm -hmm. state. Now, Beijing sits on the ocean. London sits on the ocean. Washington, New York, Baltimore. You're getting the point. They're mm -hmm. all sitting on the ocean. Which mean, And by the way, 74% of human population today, 74%, lives below the new sea level. Because we know what sea level is going to be. Because we measured it, right? So we know the sea level is going to be about 200 feet higher when every iceberg melts, mm -hmm. when every 
uh, well, I was before we went on the air. I was talking about this ceremony they had in Iceland. Uh, yeah, describe that for, for everyone. All official glaciers. One of them is now officially dead, and they put a plaque yesterday at the foot of where the glacier used to be, and the plaque basically says, "This is to warn future generations. Look what we did. We literally melted a glacier. It's gone. We got eleven left. They think it's they're going to last much longer than they are." I did a study for some very good friends over in India that they wanted to put in front of Modi. And I told them for my study, it appeared to me that the strain on the Ganges within 10 years would be unsustainable mm. because the glacier's melting so fast. Mm. And that's the 150 million people you just talked about. Wow. By the way, that same mass of glaciers, which is called the Himalaya High Plateau, is what fields all of China and Asia. The great rivers of Asia and China all come from there. So we're talking about massive destabilization from the lack of water. We're talking yeah. about massive destabilization from climate change throwing water into the cities, which will increasingly happen because storm surges will get worse because of the climate, because of the differential in temperature, which is what causes hurricanes, right? So we know that they're coming. Uh, what do they call the hurricanes over in Asia? They call them... Uh, Tsunami. Typhoons. 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 So... Those, those products of nature, which are directly traceable to the difference of temperature in the oceans and the temperature in the air. And the hotter the ocean temperature gets, the worse they get. We know that. And we know they're getting worse every year. And we know that they're going to get to the point where it's not sustainable to try and build traditional stucco homes in the face of it. It's not sustainable to build them on the ground. They're going to have to put them up on stilts. It's not sustainable to, well, you can't build a house in Paradise, California, unless you're making it out of rocks, because it's going to burn. So when you look at all of these climate, and now the best one is what just happened in the Midwest two weeks, three weeks ago. So they just came to the end of their, what they thought was their wet season, except it didn't end. And the entire Midwest was underwater. Mm -hmm. so Midwest plantings are down dramatically. Good year for it, because the Trump tariff war, which is insane, mm -hmm. has basically just you know cut off American soybean farmers, which is the major crop there in the Midwest. So they got nobody to sell to anyway. So in one sense, the flooding of their fields isn't hurting them as bad as it would if they were still selling soybeans, but it's hurting plenty bad. And remember the 16 or 19 billion at this point that the government is going to give to the farmers is only probably about half the damage that the cutoff of Chinese purchase of soybeans created. So for example, large agribusinesses getting some big checks, small family farmers aren't. Um, the guy who sells John Deere tractors ain't making a nickel on this. The local butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker are having hard times. And farmers generally would prefer to grow stuff than get canned nuts, but they'll take the hand out if they can't grow. So with what happened in the Midwest, and I think you're seeing it in the Iowa caucuses and what's going on in the Democratic Party right now, farmers in the Midwest have finally figured out, oh, my God, this is bad. This, this amount of rain is not sustainable. Um, they certainly know that in New Orleans, right? They certainly know that in they know that in places where the increasing ferocity of the weather, like what's happening in the North sector today, with mm -hmm. you know massive new trees coming down, things that should never be happening in the month of August, right? And, and tornadoes happening in July and August that shouldn't be there at all. So mm -hmm. what we have is a rapidly destabilizing environment. And it's, it's now impacting on enough different places on the globe. It's possible. I'd like to be an optimist that people get smart on time. But some of the solutions take lead time. So we can only build direct air capture plants so fast. I'm not as worried about that one because if we really decide to do it, we can move that one. It takes a long time to build something like Earthshade. It takes two to three years easily. And no one's even started so we do the basic research here at the academy. We continue to put together the papers so that people will know how to do it when they choose to do it. But so far, uh, no one's been willing to even look at doing it. And that will change as these pinpoints and crises change. I'm going to say one last thing that's positive, and then I'm going to change the subject. Fortunately, unfortunately, the amount of CO2 now in the atmosphere will cause a huge regreening as humans die. Mm -hmm. My good friend Deepak Chopra likes to say this as a way to help people gain some humility. And he says, you know, if every insect in the world died today, 
the planet would be barren within about, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. Because we, we rely on insects for the yeah. job. Mm -hmm. If every human were to die today, the earth would re return to a garden of Eden state within the same period of time. Because we have become an infestation. We started talking about the oceans, which I think is what we should go back to, because that's where I think the biggest problems lie. But they're not the only problem. Right. It's all around the biosphere. So we have to look at it as a holistic, comprehensive challenge. But yeah. what we are capable of solving, the first thing we got to do is we got to decide we're going to solve it. And don't bother trying to convince anybody that climate change is real. It's a waste of your time. I never do it. I just keep publishing stuff about what is real, and sooner or later they'll catch up, just like they did with, <laughs> with the moonshot. <laughs> right, with the moonshot. We, we were talking about that earlier today. I, I belong to a, an inter international choralist forum, and this Forbes article that was just published last month came out talking about this need for a moonshot of a solution for climate change mitigation. And meanwhile, that's been work that, that you were very familiar with several uh, years back. I wrote a paper on it six years ago. I gave a big speech on it three three years ago. Anybody who wants to go to worldbusiness.org, you see what the name of that one is. I, I think it's called uh, it's called California Moonshot. And what what yeah, we'll how, put that link down below too. Yeah, California Moonshot. And what it was is I was asked the way it happened. I was asked by a commission of the Public Utilities Commission here in California. You know, um, how fast could we get to 100% green energy and what would it cost? So I looked at that for about well, two years. Just, as my wife would say, when I look at anything for two years, I gather a lot of data. Two years is a long time for me to be in the lab. <laughs> and, um, and what I concluded was we could get, now listen to these numbers, these are accurate. We could get to 100% green energy in 10 years or less at wow. zero additional cost to the public. That's and amazing. That's wonderful. And we called it the California moonshot. Mm -hmm. So I told the PUC, they laughed at it. They, oh, how can that be that possible? I mean, this is just crazy. You know, it's, it's not. Take a look at it. And the core principle that we talked about there, and by the way, if they go to the video, which is a, it's not great, it wasn't broadcast quality. I did it for a conference in Sacramento, so it was like you know, home movies, but it, you can still see the slides. It works. Yeah. And, what I did, the core principle behind that was we invented the, and we started pioneering a thing called microgrids. Now we didn't really invent it because we came across some basic research that had been talked about in the theoretical way about microgrids. But we took and said, okay, we know how to do this. And we met with the head PhD in the state of California, who's in charge of all of the electricity in California. And we told him our theory. And he said, I agree, that's mine too. Have you read my paper? I said, yeah, I read your paper. That's why I came to see it. <laughs> so, uh, so it was an interesting conversation. Um, and at the end of it, I said, in your paper, there's a footnote that says there's only one thing you guys couldn't figure out when you wanted to do this microgrid. And let me explain what I mean by microgrid. A microgrid can be as small as one building, can be as large as 100,000 people. Mm -hmm. The essence of a microgrid is that you create all the energy you need locally. So you eliminate all transmission lines. So you mm -hmm. save a tremendous amount of energy, you save a tremendous amount of expense, you eliminate all the really expensive forms of energy like nuclear, coal, all that crap goes away instantly because microgrids work best if you use a natural source of energy. So you use um, wind at four cents or less per kilowatt. You use solar at four cents a kilowatt. You use uh, geothermal at four cents a kilowatt. You, you, know, you, you use hydroelectric where possible. So you, you use, and you, including a form of hydroelectric that doesn't even take water, which uses mass dropped from a hill. So all those methods can be used. And the question was, well, gee, how do you tie them together so that when the wind don't blow and the sun don't shine, you have energy? And in this, in their paper, uh, Lorenzo Christoph was the PhD's name. And, and he, he published that, that paper with a guy he often writes with, is a guy named Dr. Paul DiBartini. And Paul at Caltech. Mm -hmm. And in the paper, they said, it is, which is our theory, if you think of California as a series of microgrids like honeycombs, where each one makes its own energy, but it's attached to everyone around it. Hmm. And if there's, a, if there's winds not, for example, here in Santa Barbara, we don't have enough wind to make wind energy. Mm -hmm. 16 miles away, we do, Lompoc. So, but, but there's a problem. There's no wire between Lompoc and Santa Barbara. So how do you get the wind energy from Lompoc to Santa Barbara on a day when there is no wind in Santa Barbara and they're having a storm, so there's not enough sun. 
And the answer is hydrogen. So I said to Paul, I said, Paul, I, oh, to Lorenzo, I said, Lorenzo, I know the solution to your to the question in your footnote. How do you port power between microgrids that are non-contiguous? So if they're contiguous, they look like a honeycomb. No problem. And I'll give you an example where that's already worked. If they're non-contiguous, there's 16 miles of empty space, and you don't want to do transmission lines, which you don't. Mm -hmm. Get it there. And the answer is you electrolyze the wind energy in Lompoc. You convert it into hydrogen, and I can drive it here in a truck in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, and when I've got a fuel cell, which is the component to each port of each microgrid, mm -hmm. that fuel cell then uses the hydrogen, keeps everything running. So hydrogen becomes your battery as well as your fuel. That's the solution. And that's what we put out as, as the California moonshot. Lorenzo embraced it immediately. Mm -hmm. I went to my friend who's the head hydrogen researcher in America, Dr. Samuelson down at Irvine, he's one of our guys. And, and I showed him the paper. He said, here's what I'm give to Lorenzo. Do you guys know each other? You, you guys should know each other. <laughs> you, you're working on the, on the other end of the street, but you guys should be introduced you to. You should know each other. And here's what we're writing him. And he said, Grady changed one word in my paper, one word. And uh, which was a clarification. I used the word shift, meaning diurnal shift, and he misinterpreted it as phase shift. He said, well, call it diurnal shift, and I don't have a problem, which I did. That was the only change in the paper as written. Mm -hmm. And I sent it to Lawrence. I said, Paul, you know, Samuelson signed off. Tell Paul, we got the answer. That's how you port power. And um, since then, he's adopted it, Lorenzo and Paul. And they've gone around the state declaring it. Well, in the three years since we did that, the state has come around and say, you know, Michael is the future for California. Oh, wow. Yeah. And they're now also beginning to see the hydrogen the way you unlock that future. So we, we have an opportunity. And I, I just want to say this one last optimistic thing. I've never seen or heard about, read, or encountered a problem facing humans that we cannot solve with today's technology and resources, if we have the will. What's been lacking is the will. So the reason I don't talk to people about climate change and convince them, climate change is doing that for me. I don't waste my breath. I look at the solutions. What can I do to fix this problem? Not convince people it's there. They'll find it out the hard way. You know, They'll build too close to the ocean on a barrier reef, <laughs> right? <laughs> And their house will be removed by the ocean and deposited where it belongs at the bottom of Davy Jones's locker. <laughs> violence, right? I mean, come on, and they're there for a reason, you know. Um, anyway, so I, I, I let it leave with this, and I wish everybody watching this. I, I do a thing since last January, which uh, I published called Optimist Daily. You get it? I sure do. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> So, by the way, we went on a maternity leave schedule of three days a week because our chief operating officer uh, just had her first baby. Uh, but she's coming back on board. So we go back to five days a week, I think, next Monday. So for those of you who have been wondering why we're only doing three, I think we told people, but we're back to five days on Monday. So five days a week, it takes you two minutes to read it in the morning, a little yeah. longer before we get into it. And it's got every piece of good information about a solution somewhere that's happening that you didn't know. And you go, oh, wow, I didn't know that. That makes me feel better. And once people feel better, they're willing to say, okay, we can beat this problem. So how do we beat the problem? We also have a radio show, which I urge everybody to listen to, called Solutions News. And it's uh, you can get it uh, through our – we turn it into a podcast, but it's a live show. We do it 5 to 6 o'clock every Friday here in Santa Barbara Drive Time on the most powerful local AM station, 1290. And my commitment for that show is I never introduce a problem for which we don't, in the same show, cover the solution. Mm -hmm. So it's about solutions. And I want to keep people positive and thinking solutions because as it gets more and more negative, which it will, mm -hmm. people go into that with either cynicism, fear, or hope. And yeah. when I, I want them to go with hope because cynicism, fear will just lock us into a worse pattern. Mm -hmm. Look what you got for current political leadership with cynicism and fear. <laughs> right, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you bring up such a good point about the, the Optimist Daily, and uh, that is constantly the conversation that I have to have with folks. Is you know, even even that's the reason why I kind of stepped away from the hardcore research field that I was in was because every conference you were going to, it was more bad news after another. I was literally witnessing scientists giving up hope on humanity because. They weren't listening and, and they they were done, you know, and um, it was going in one ear out the other. And so it's so true that we do have to maintain the optimism that there are solutions and that the way that you put it to saying that the solutions are possible with the technology we have now, because that's what people are believing is that 
oh, but it's decades away. We're never going to reach it, and we're all going to be gone before then. Nope. And even if you were, which you won't be, your kids will be here. Your grandkids will be here. What kind of responsibility is that? I mean, that's just terrible to think, oh, well, the earth is going to get, all the people of the earth are going to get destroyed, but I'll be gone anyway. Who cares? I mean, that's a hell of a note. It really but, is. <laughs> and I call that attitude a lot. And one of the things, I do believe we are capable of solving this. My concern is we're not moving fast enough to do so. Mm -hmm. So five years ago, we started a new project here uh, called the Lifeboat Project. And I named it the Lifeboat Project because in, in that same book I told you about earlier today, uh, Freedom from Many Soil, in chapter one, uh, my first heading was a Titanic miscalculation. <laughs> and what I talked about was when they built the Titanic, they believed so completely that it could not be sunk. Mm -hmm. so like humans believing they can survive climate change and keep destroying the biosphere. The arrogance of that, the, what the Greeks would call the hubris of that clearly led to a disaster. Well, because they believed it could not be sunk, they didn't decide, they decided they didn't need a lot of lifeboats. Mm -hmm. They put a few on for decoration, but they really didn't need them. So there wasn't a lifeboat for everybody. So in that tragedy, it's the only time in human history where there was a clear right red line. If you got to a lifeboat, you lived without exception. Every single person who got into a lifeboat lived. Every person who did not died. Lifeboat live, no lifeboat dead. Why? Because the lifeboat kept you alive till they could come find you. Mm -hmm. Lifeboats do. So we started a project. If if humanity does completely blow it, can we create communities around the world, one or more, where people could go and live through this climate crisis, mm -hmm. survive, fairly primitive way, but survive, and repopulate the earth again when the crisis is over. Because as I said a little bit ago, the amount of green that will grow and will be very, very quick once humanity is out of the way. Yeah. So, you know, when Beijing's gone, there's nothing but trees growing there. Well, it won't be trees because it's below ocean, but it'll be halophytes. Right. Or, you know, it'll be trees everywhere else. So we have a very real probability that humanity will fail. So even though I like to stay with everything being positive, the, the bottom line is that it's not something we can count on for sure. So the end of the story is we created a thing called the Lifeboat Project. We've located some real estate where we believe a quantity of people could live indefinitely without outside support. And hopefully it doesn't happen, it doesn't come about, but we're now creating all of the subsystems that society would have to have in order to prosper. So on the assumption there will be no fish in the sea, we've created an aquaculture system on land. Mm -hmm. On the assumption there won't be internet, we've created a system which doesn't require computers, et cetera, et cetera. On the assumption that we won't have enough electricity in 100 years because we won't be having the copper to make it, uh, we made everything dri driven by uh, hydraulics, falling mm -hmm. water. Okay, I won't go any further, but, but, but we are doing that work, and we will continue to do that work as a lifeboat. In case the Titanic goes down. Mm -hmm. And 95% of our work, though, is to try to alert people on ways to keep the Titanic from sinking in the first place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that starts with get rid of the humans, get rid of the arrogance. We are big and bad enough to destroy this whole planet's biosphere. The planet will be just fine. Right. The, mm -hmm. the biosphere is what we depend on. That's going to go away. And when it comes back, there ain't going to be many of us left. Right. You know, to to wrap this up, what what do you really hope at the end of the day? On what level? <laughs> um, you know, I um, I hope that we get to finish building the lifeboat so that there is a place where my kids and grandkids can be. Um, I hope that we don't ever need it; that it will turn into a tourist attraction because mm -hmm. it was unnecessary, but. You know, kind of like the way people built bomb shelters back in the 50s and we didn't need them, thank God. Mm -hmm. that was a um, and bomb shelters didn't make any sense because a nuclear exchange would have gotten in a bomb shelter. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> but I think that uh, what I would hope for, I hope for people to wake up. Mm -hmm. I hope that a business, which the business roundtable started to wakes up 
And C, it's in businesses' interests to protect the biosphere. Mm -hmm. You cannot make a profit in the middle of an area that's desertifying because of climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't be a homeowner and a home developer in Paradise, California. I could go on and on and on. The examples are legion. So from my point of view, uh, I hope people wake up. And my hope is that they wake up sooner rather than later because the amount of human death and misery is going to escalate now dramatically. It's already happened, but mm -hmm. it's way beyond anything people can imagine. And when even they talk about the surge of 750,000 people out of the triangle of Nicaragua, Honduras, and Guatemala, well, they're talking about climate change. What's happening now there is people are not able to make a living the traditional way. Right. So they're doing it with gangs and violence. And that's, that's what always happens when s states fall apart. When a sovereign nation declines, Assyria, in Afghanistan, Somalia, take your pick, Mali, Libya, I mean, I, I go all around the globe. When they collapse, the first thing that happens is these people come in who are, are basically warlords. So Genghis Khan was a warlord, just a very efficient one. Mm -hmm. The warlords, uh, the Goths, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, all warlords. And the mentality of a warlord is, I can't make this thing work as a farmer. I'm going to kill, pillage, and rape. And every 20 years, I'll do it again. The same village. So the Vikings literally had like a cities of villages that they would hit every 20 years on a cycle in northern England because they had to wait 20 years for another crop of boys and women. So then they would rape the women, kill the boys and men, steal the food, and let somebody else worry about it for the next 20 years. Hmm. So that... Kind of, and we called those people in the Middle Ages, we called them barbarians. Mm -hmm. That's just another term for warlord. <clears throat> so people are going to be left with the choice, kill or be killed. And I don't want to see people in that choice. I know I don't want to make that choice. Mm -hmm. And I know that the pressures that, of violence that are pushing us towards that choice require us to wake up, get conscious, and deal with the underlying problems rather than seeing each other as the enemy or the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I would. Uh, wow. Thank you so much, Ronaldo, for sharing your insight. This has been an incredibly important conversation. I think our audience also could recognize that it's um, a perspective that hasn't been shared a lot. And it's a really challenging conversation to have. But I love your angle on it because you actually know the science. You've been doing the science to see that there is another way to look at this. And this is with the perspective of optimism and that. Uh, now is the time to wake up. And I love how you say that. So thank you so much for sharing your time. My pleasure. And if, you're, if your audience wants to send you questions and you want to give me a phone call, I'll be happy to respond to it. I mean, we've got to get the word out. So I'm more than happy to do it. And if you want me to come on air and do it live, I'll do it live or I'll, we'll do it some other way, but get the word out. A thousand percent, yes. And so everybody stay tuned. We're gonna make sure that we include all of these links down below. Uh, we'll also make sure you can sign up for that Optimus Daily um, newsletter. And it's free. It's free. <laughs> it's free. <laughs> to, to gain more knowledge, to gain more optimism, start off your day like that. And uh, it's it's a really wonderful resource that you have out there. And we'll also link to, to that white paper that you just came out with, the Methane Accelerator, so people can get uh, more knowledge and get more background about that. And the well, California Moon Shot. Take a look at it. You'll love it. It's really good. Yeah. I'm proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Paula, I've got to go to my next appointment. Thank you very much. And got all it. Thank come you so here. much. Come visit me in Lala here in Santa Barbara. We'd love to see you. Uh, that would be fantastic. You better believe me. I'll be planning on it. So thank okay. you again, everybody. And I'll see you next time on Conversations with Paola. Bye.